Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming out to listen, and thanks for those of you who have been sitting here for a week taking some pretty heavy stuff. Um, but I also will talk about some heavy stuff, but I do not want to dwell on the heavy stuff because I think there's a lot we can do to turn this around right now. I'm actually totally an eternal optimist. It may not seem that way when I start my talk, but bear with me because I really think this is a critical moment we can turn things around. So I'm super excited about what I have to share with you today. Um, the, the title of my talk, Total Load, is about um, looking at the big picture here. You know, sometimes when you are um, listening to some of these lectures or talking about some of these topics, whether it's climate change or, you know, chronic disease or whatever it is, we get into the weeds. I mean, just that, that movie you just watched, um, Generation Zapped, is you get into the weeds about EMF and it can feel so overwhelming about what do we do and how do we change this. But what I want to talk about is um, taking the 10,000 foot view, pull back a little bit, look at the big picture and see how we can solve this problem. So let's get this uh, slide moving forward. Here we go. So this is how we may be feeling at this moment right now right when we started talking about the, the the oceans dying and deforestation and we start talking about the all the health problems and all the ems and the chemicals we feel this sense of profound degradation of our environment of our lives on this planet and we really do feel kind of at this tipping point right where, where we see it happening it's like a slow moving train wreck and we don't exactly know how to deal with this. Um, it is a critical moment in time. Some of you may have um, read the book, The Sixth Mass Extinction by Elizabeth Colbert. Um, she talks about how you know, there have been a series of mass extinctions in the history of planet Earth, and are we in what is called the sixth mass extinction, uh, meaning that we are annihilating species one by one on this planet, eliminating biodiversity. And this is an, an image that's uh, taken from the New York Times in response to her, the publication of her book. And it shows in here the red are the species that are um, endangered, threatened. And then the black is the ones that are theoretically not threatened. But it's broken down into you know, flowering plants, mollusks, fishes, crustaceans, all the different types of species. We're losing biodiversity on this planet at a breathtaking rate. So the author postulates, are we sitting here watching a mass extinction unfold? And one of the interesting things is that she postulates that, yes, we are watching all these species die out. But interestingly, humans are profoundly adaptable. We have this amazing capacity to adapt to our environment, despite all these things that are killing off other species. But what I argue is that we're actually looking at human extinction unfolding right along with the extinction of all these other species. Humans are profoundly adaptable, but are we truly adaptable to what's happening on the planet right now? And this is a, a graph that shows the, the biodiversity, the number of species going down, um, you know, freshwater species, marine species, vertebrate species, and so on. So this is a, a question that I ask myself all the time. Are we facing human extinction? Are we going to extinct ourselves because of the way we're living on this planet right now? And, and Steve, in his opening, was spot on in that there has been an environmental movement for quite a long time since the industrial era has become apparently uh, something that's destroying our planet. And the, the environmental movement is broad and diverse, and there's an amazing number of environmental advocates and, and NGOs trying to change things on this planet, trying to save the polar bears, trying to stop deforestation, trying to stop the polar caps from melting, climate change, on and on and on. There's so much great work being done out there to try and save the planet. But why isn't this taking hold the way it should be? Why aren't we all jumping on the bandwagon saying, yeah, we got to save those rainforests, like today, stop this, this is nonsense. The ocean is dying. Why are we not all like with our hair on fire about this? And I'm, I'm, I'm one of those people. Why are we not freaking out about what's happening to our planet? And I think part of the reason is because we don't see the connection between what's happening to the planet 
and what's happening to us in our daily lives. I mean, truly, what are we doing in our daily lives? We get up, we go to work, we try to feed our family, we try to do the best we can every single day, and it is hard sometimes. It is hard just surviving. I can't worry about the polar bears. I don't have bandwidth for that. That is sort of the experience that we're having. We know it's a problem. We know it's there. It's too overwhelming. But what I think we need to do to change that dynamic, to make it relevant that the polar bears are dying out, that we're killing species on this planet at a breathtaking rate, the way to make that relevant is to make the environment relevant to us. We need to make the case that the environment, this like nebulous thing we always talk about, oh, it's, it's not good for the environment. The environment? No, it's our environment. It's our bathtub that we're swimming in, right? So we need to make the case that the environment matters to us, to you, to each and every one of us. So put this in context a little bit here. You know, we've been in, if you look at the history of humankind, we've been in this age of uh, pestilence and famine. That's the past, right? Where we were really at the uh, mercy of infectious diseases, lack of nutrition. There were all those kinds of things that kept humankind from surviving. And that's where pe people died from lack of nutrition. People died from infectious diseases. And what's happened in the modern era in just a really short period of time, you know, since humans have been on this planet, is we've moved out of that age of pestilence and famine and into this age of man-made degenerative diseases, chronic illness. So we are now smack dab in the middle of this situation where we're not dying of infectious diseases at the rate that humans used to. We got a handle on that pretty, pretty well. But we're dying and suffering from chronic disease. And I think this moment in history where we're all struggling with symptoms, chronic conditions, our kids are sick, and I'll talk a little bit more specifically about what's happening, but I actually think this is such a critical moment for us as human beings on this planet to make a choice. And how many of you are familiar with the, the film The Matrix, where you're given the option to take the blue pill or the red pill? And the blue pill is you just continue on, ignorance is bliss, just keep going about your life, not really paying attention, all is well, or not so well, but you just continue as you are. And then you take the red pill, and the red pill is like profound awakening to what's really going on. And I think this is not intentional, but it's happening that the chronic illness epidemic that's sweeping through the modern industrialized world is forcing us to take the red pill. We may not be aware of it, but it's happening. And this is why I'm so optimistic. So the backdrop for this whole scenario is that in the US, we have an unprecedented number of people diagnosed with chronic health conditions. More than half of American adults have a chronic health condition, and many have several chronic health conditions. What's more troubling is we have an epidemic of chronic illness in our children. Now, you probably all just took that sentence in without really thinking about it, but if you put this into historical perspective, children don't get chronic illnesses. Chronic illnesses or something typically that really happened to adults. You know, if you go back to the 1960s, just a few decades ago, you had a very low rate of chronic illnesses among children, less than 10%. And it would be maybe asthma, uh, maybe an occasional type 1 diabetes, uh, maybe some eczema. You know, it wasn't an overwhelming number of children that were living with chronic illnesses. Fast forward to today, and you have 54% of American children with at least one diagnosed chronic illness. That's more than half of American children who have at least one chronic illness. And that's a statistic that reflects diagnosed chronic conditions. That's not even talking about the kids who have all these kinds of symptoms that are maybe a mixed bag of symptoms that don't get a label. So the kid who has severe anxiety and chronic constipation and sinus infections every month and is on antibiotics routinely, that kid's not being picked up by a diagnostic statistic. So if we have 54% of kids with a diagnosis, how many kids are actually not well? How many kids are actually healthy? Now let's take these statistics and compare them to the adult statistics I just gave you. So if the adults today, if half of them have a chronic illness, and you go back and, and remember that only a fraction of those kids, when they were kids, were sick. 
Now, what happens when you take 50% of today's kids and you grow them up? How many adults are going to be healthy in 20 years? Not many. So one of the things that is causing us to miss this, to not really see what's going on, is that we tend to see these things through our own lenses, right? So if you have a child, for instance, with an anaphylactic allergy, you might be aware of the fact that there's an allergy epidemic. Or if your child has eczema, you might look into the fact that, boy, eczema is on the rise, or there's an increasing number of children with, with asthma. Or if your child has an autoimmune condition, you might be paying attention to the fact that there's an autoimmune epidemic. And all of these things are rising concurrently. But this one is the one that is most profoundly disturbing to me, in that we now have one in 40 children in the U.S. diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. And autism is a spectrum, and there are severely impacted kids and adults, although just a few decades ago we really weren't talking about adults with autism very frequently, but now they're aging out. These first crop of kids who were diagnosed with autism are now becoming adults. Um, one in 40 kids. That number just a few years ago when I started this work, a little bit less than a decade ago, was one in 150. So the rate of autism, the rate of increase we're seeing every year is truly disturbing because if you project those numbers forward just a couple of years, we're going to be at one in four children with an autism spectrum disorder by 2033. And that's actually a conservative estimate. I know Stephanie Seneff is an MIT professor, has projected a much higher rate than that and much sooner. So this is really troubling, especially because autism affects boys more than girls. So if you project these numbers forward, there are not going to be very many boys who don't have an autism spectrum disorder if things stay the way they are, if, if uh, it's status quo. So all these epidemics, all these discrete epidemics, the obesity epidemic, the asthma epidemic, everything is kind of concurrently rising. What we're not seeing is the common denominator here. This is one epidemic of chronic inflammatory diseases. What's going on here is all of these conditions, whether it's a mood disorder like depression or schizophrenia, whether it's obesity, whether it's ADHD, inflammation is there at the root, at the core. So there's a common denominator here, and we're not looking at the root causes of what's contributing to this chronic illness epidemic. And I think it's important to put this into historical perspective. Because when you're a new parent and you look around and your child has ADHD and your neighbor's child has ADHD and you know so many kids who have autism, it begins to feel normal. And I think there's no better example of that than allergy. So allergy is new. There's a book actually by this title called Allergy, A Modern Malady, because it's a new thing. We forget this. People tend to think like, well, allergies are just something you have, you know, when you tear up or you, you get a runny nose in the spring, oh, it's just my allergies, you know, and everybody understands what that means. But had that been 150 years ago and you're like, oh, it's just my allergies, nobody would have known what you were talking about because they didn't exist. There is in the historical record evidence of allergy as early as Hippocrates, so thousands of years ago, that uh, people were allergic to bee stings, and, and that did happen. But the, the environmental allergies, the allergies to food, the anaphylaxis, all new. You go back to the um, middle of the 19th century, that's when you begin to see the first evidence of these environmental allergies that we see as the modern world was, was coming out of its industrial age or you know, really coming into its industrial age, I should say. That's when you actually saw people developing environmental allergies. And interestingly, it was among the wealthy, among the people who lived more indoor lives, who uh, ate more processed, refined kind of foods. Um, and you didn't see it among the working classes. The next kind of evolution in the history of allergy is you get anaphylaxis. The term is coined in 1902. It didn't exist before 1902. And the way that it came about is a man named Charles Richet, who was a scientist who um, was testing dogs, and he actually um, made a mixture of meat injected it with a syringe into dogs, and then fed the dogs the same meat, and the dogs developed anaphylaxis and died. That's interesting. He coined a term. We don't see a lot of anaphylaxis until later, 1930s, you begin seeing something that looks like anaphylaxis that's called serum sickness. That came after sort of a, a diphtheria shot. 
Um, four million, million penicillin allergies by the time you get into the middle of the century, 40 million, uh, sorry, four million penicillin allergies. That's new. And as just as a sort of historical footnote, antibiotics were new in the post-World War II era. Sort of we had this round of sulfa drugs that became antibiotics that are now commonplace and ubiquitous in American society. And then you don't really see anaphylaxis till food till the century progresses on. Now you have 50,000 ER visits for anaphylaxis every single year. One in 17 children in this country have a life-threatening food allergy. That means if they eat a peanut or milk, they could die. Imagine talking to your great-great-grandparents about this and trying to explain to them that, oh, don't give my child that milk because she'll die. That's just so crazy. But that's what I wanted to point out here is this is really a historical anomaly. This is a brand new phenomenon. And of course, all of this is happening and rising concurrently with all these neurobehavioral disorders like autism, ADHD, sensory integration, PANS and PANDAS, OCD, NCD, and so on. It's all new. And that, again, is why we don't really think about it, because we're immersed in it. It feels normal to us. You know, if you're in a, a playgroup as a new mom with a baby, and your child is on Prilosec because they have reflux, which is really actually oftentimes a food allergy or food sensitivity, and your friend's baby's on Prevacid for the same problem, and your other friend's child is on Prilosec, it feels normal. These are the kinds of things that new parents see every day and feels normal. The Autism Speaks bumper stickers are ubiquitous. They're everywhere. Adderall, Stratera, peanut-free tables at school, Miralax. I cannot tell you how many children in this country get through the day on Miralax. Did you know you're supposed to poop every day? Most people don't know that. Most people think it's like once a week, that's all right. And if your child has a problem, you give them Miralax. Miralax has toxic ingredients on it, and people are giving to this, this to their children every day just to make them poop. That's a profound problem. But it all feels normal because it's everywhere, and it's all around us. And this is the one. I always throw this picture up because I see so many babies who are supposed to have beautiful, perfect, fresh skin, and so many babies have eczema. This is an, an allergy. This is a, an inflammatory response oftentimes. Something they're eating or something in their environment is making them have this kind of response. The eczema on the cheeks, the rosy cheeks, the red ears, that's an inflammatory response in the body. It's not normal, but it's common, so we think it's normal. This is why I wrote my book. It's called The Compromised Generation, because I wanted to know what the heck is happening to our kids. I don't remember this from when I was a kid. I think I had one friend in elementary school who had asthma. One, and I was like, what is that weird thing you have to do, the inhaler? I mean, it was, there wasn't any of this. Not in the numbers that we see today. So I wrote this book because I wanted to know why. Why are our kids so sick? 